Hey, this is Todd. Let's talk about using motifs to help define areas in your hex crawl. I'm referring to two aspects of the definition. One as a pattern and two as a dominant feature. And in fact, what I'm gonna be talking about is really combining those things by creating patterns of dominant features to help differentiate areas in your hex crawl. Let's talk about what I mean by that. Oftentimes with hexes, it can become a drag to continue to describe different areas that are more or less the same from the player's perspective. How many different ways can you describe walking through the woods? However, on the GM side of the screen, you may see that there is a tribe of goblins who are inhabiting this particular hex of woods who did not control, dominate, or really wander into too much the hex that the players were in before. Of course, they don't see a hard border between goblin-controlled forest hex and non-goblin controlled forest hex. So how might you communicate that this area is controlled by these goblins? There are obvious things you could do. They could have totems that they've erected or other kinds of monuments or markers of their dominions. But what you may find is if you have different tribes or factions or groups of these goblins, you want to give them different associations. You want to give them different symbols differentiate them from each other or differentiate a group of orcs from a group of goblins. Maybe on the surface, your mind might go to the same things. Well, sure, the orcs are going to want to also mark off their territory. The orcs are also going to want to post warning signs or just regular signs or street signs that proclaim that this is theirs or that there might be other signs of their passing. But perhaps when you are trying to do all this on the fly in your game, you end up with again, a lot of repetitive descriptions. What the I'm trying to introduce here with this concept of using motifs is to create symbols and different identifying features a little bit in advance when you know they're coming. That way, when you're riffing off in the moment and you know that there's a tribe of or group of goblins out there in this woods, you didn't really think that the party was gonna go that way, but by hook or by crook, they ended up there. You can quickly reference a few notes over here and then use that to fire up your imagination, power those brain cells, come up with ways to describe this area to hopefully give cues to your players or at least put do that, come meet them halfway by putting these cues in front of them. If they choose to ignore them or not pick them up, well, that comes on them, but they're there. And of course, just as a help and aid to describe different areas and make them more or less unique, give that world a lived in feel Right, because when you do go to different areas in our real world, they tend to change sometimes subtly, sometimes massively, and we wanna to try to communicate them, but do them in ways that are not putting too much pressure on you in the moment to come up with things. So we wanna do a little legwork. If you've watched any of my videos, a lot of times my concepts are do a little legwork here to prevent you from having to do a lot of brain work over here. That way you can really utilize that brain work for more important or interesting things instead of getting bogged down. These, these tools are always helpful for me. Obviously, everyone's brain works a little bit differently. Everybody does things a little differently. Maybe you'll find that this kind of technique just bogs you down on those days leading up to your game day rather than helping you. So in that case, ignore it or, hey, take this idea, run with it, make it your own. Let's go back to that group of goblins. Let's say, and I'm just gonna be kind of stereotypical here, I know that there is a vast spectrum of how goblins uh, can be in different games, but I'm just going for the bottom line, old school, if you will, stereotypical goblin. Let's just say that we have a, a goblin, the tribe of the red claw. So I've had this, I've had them in my notes, I'd marked out, oh yeah, here's where these goblins are. And, and maybe either previously there had been some plot hooks I'd laid down saying, oh, hey, these there's some goblin issues over there in this town. The players had gone in another direction, but for whatever reason, now they're veering into that territory. Now I might think about what maybe what makes these uh, goblins unique a little bit, what just differentiates them from another group of goblins. They obviously have one motif I've already kind of given them, which is a red claw. So now I can think about, well, how might they use this symbol that they have, this name that they have, how might that manifest in the world? Maybe they will paint, perhaps with blood, if they're really, I wanna make them really nasty, or maybe just paint, let's just say it's blood, that they will paint in prominent areas, maybe if there's a big rock tumble or a large tree, they will find painted on it a rough, in blood, a rough red claw. Great, 
So that's one thing. I can write that down in my notes and I can put that with whatever this faction or group notes I have. I can just lay that in here. What I'm suggesting here is not creating a novel's worth of ideas. I'm really looking for just a couple of bullet points. That's what helps me. I, I'm, I'm a note card, bullet point kind of person. I just, I just want some bullet point notes. Red claws painted with blood is enough that when it comes to that game day, and I need it, I look that up and I'll, that will trigger my memory, whatever my brain, what are the memory museum or the, the mansion of memory, it will kind of trigger that, oh yeah, they, they like to paint red claws with blood wherever they go. So that's great, that's one. Maybe another one would be that as they've, as they've gone and cleared out the different animals and creatures that used to be there to wherever they're wherever those goblins are now, they're going to they're going to wipe out kind of other predators and other larger creatures that are there, either just for food or sport or just to make space for themselves. Maybe they do things with the claws of those animals because they are the red claw. Maybe they will make strings with claws and they'll hang them between the trees or across the path or they'll make uh, kind of chimes sort of just wind things where they'll put a collection of these claws and hang them from branches and so the claws will just kind of click clack in the breeze. Great. That's another one. And I, and I could write all that down or I could just write down strings of animal claws or animal slash creature claws if I want to be more specific for whatever reason. Game day comes along. They've seen some paintings on trees and, and, and boulders of, of red claws. They keep moving. Maybe the next thing they see or maybe in combination would be these collections of claws. And I don't need to specify which animals they are or creatures. I will, on the fly, I can think about, oh, you see there's some bear claws, maybe some owl bear claws, maybe some badger claws. And I'll just, I can riff on that, but that gives me another, another symbol, another motif that I can weave into creating a pattern of, hey, these are the things that define where these red claw goblins live. So let's think of a third one. And it doesn't, they don't all have to revolve around the red claw, right? They can, that could be one thing. What else do they do? Maybe the way that they they burn a lot of stuff out, but maybe they do some kind of slash and burn type stuff. They'll make some rude kind of uh, sort of charcoal, I don't know, or, or, or just wood fire kind of forges for reforging metal that they've plundered, something like that. Something that has to do with the fact that they are aggressive and they don't really care about the environment. They're just going to cut some stuff down if they need to reforge some weapons or, or do anything of that nature, they're just gonna cut some stuff down, put it in a pile, just get it burning so it's hot enough to do what they need to do. And when they're finished with it, they're just gonna leave. So I can put there, I can put, okay, remnants of wood fire, rough wood fire forging, right? I just need enough to, again, trigger my mind because my mind, when I hear that or I read that, I will go, oh yeah, these are the kind of things I thought about. Obviously, feel free to, if you want to write down more elements of it or not, that's up to you. But great, there is a third motif. And of course, if you are invigorated and you got, have a lot of inspiration, then sure, you could write down as many as you want. It probably makes sense that the, the more prominent a faction is, maybe the more dominant in their environment, or the more they're going to play into the world, or at least you think they're going to play into the world, the more motifs you may want to define for them, the more of these this pattern, a larger pattern, and of course you can make variations in the pattern that you could have. In this case, with these goblins, with these three things, we have a couple of variations. Each one of those things individually, they run across a, a pit filled with charred bits of wood and, and, and maybe other things, maybe some bits of metal that just they scraped off or whatever, slag, maybe whatever. And I would look up to get a little bit of a better idea what might be in a forge area, but those kind of things. They could run across the painted claws. They could run across the, the actual uh, kind of claw chime things. They could run across a pit that has a red claw painted next to it, or a pit that has the claw chimes next to it, or the painted claw and the chimes, right? You have all these different things. And of course, if we're rolling for wandering monsters or random encounters and we run into those goblins, we can integrate those things into that moment. Well, if I roll a random encounter and I get goblins, might these goblins be someone that are working at that forge? Might they be painting red claws around or butchering an animal and, and getting rid of the claws? Or they just could be doing other things that they might do on patrol, a little encampment, whatever. But it adds more fuel to the imaginative fires to do more things 
with these goblins. It can also be used for creatures like anything that really, any creature that's going to really dominate and alter their environment. So we're we're not really talking most animals, regular animals, because they don't tend to do that. You know, it may be you'd say, oh, well, bears mark trees and things like that. And sure, you could write down that motif, bears, marking trees. Scat could be another one if you wanted to, to do some scat. But definitely for things like dragons and other fantastical creatures that really when they're settled in a place, they really dominate that place. You could think about, well, what, what would be the motifs of this particular dragon? And we can do it on a dragon, you know, a type of dragon layer. Well, this is what red dragons would be like versus blue versus green. But of course, you also have individual dragons. And we can think about a way again of making sure that an individual dragon has a unique flavor by thinking about what motifs might belong to that particular dragon in addition to or instead of the ones that we think about just on that type of dragon generally. So yes, red dragons probably gonna be a lot of charred areas, things that they've burnt, lots of you know dust and soot and ash. But then this particular dragon, maybe he has a real liking for gold not just in his hordes, but just gold. So maybe gold paint and things. So maybe there'll be these weird objects that are painted with gold. Maybe they'll find boulders that the dragon has had kobolds or other kind of species, other creatures that work for them or are just enslaved by them, or he's demanded painted with gold, like gold eggs. So not only do you get these general dragon features, suddenly you come across a, a boulder that's rounded and painted like a great giant gold egg. Right, that's an interesting thing, and that belongs just to this dragon. So you can use these things to really create unique elements of your hex crawl. You could obviously take these things and you could create a bunch of random tables if you just knew that, okay, well, I'm running into this wood hex. I don't have anything particular there. I don't have any goblins or any other creatures that I've specifically placed there. Create create some tables, and you know, if. If you've watched any of my videos, you know me, I, I love me some tables. You could create a bunch of tables. Maybe I'll create some tables and throw it on Patreon. I'll throw it somewhere of different things that you could combine together to make an interesting area. And of course, once I have those, that's gonna, again, gonna fire up my imagination because I wanna think about, well, why are these things here? So let's take the dragon out of the equation. Maybe I rolled on a table. Oh, gold, boulder. Okay, there are gold boulders here. And I think in my brain, I think, well, it's not gonna be solid gold. That doesn't make sense. At least not to me, maybe in some other games. Like, whoa, solid gold boulders. What do you do with that? Which actually would be pretty interesting. What would a party do if they ran across a giant gold boulder or a field that was full of these giant gold boulders? Or maybe it would be, you know, gold, egg, rock, right? And then you combine them and think, oh, okay, they're kind of egg-shaped rocks, boulders that are gold or painted gold. So, but I look at my brand, I think, okay, these boulders are painted gold here. Before I put them in my players, I might roll a random encounter or roll a wandering monster check to see not that creatures are there, but now to make an association. Okay, so I have gold, boulders, let's roll a die, a witch. All right, so now we have a witch and we have gold boulders. I might need to send the party out on a little five minute coffee break or drink break, or bathroom break, so I could think about, okay, we got a witch, we got gold boulders, maybe I'll roll for another motif. But you can see how, and I'm not, again, I could go down a whole rabbit hole and maybe I should do a, a live stream where I just, can just have fun going down rabbit holes of, of tables, but you can see how you can take these things and weave it together to help define different areas in your world as you're going into it, which is really what I think a lot of the fun is for me in the hex crawls. You have this open world and you get to just go with the flow and and just see what comes out of it. But a problem can be, we have vast areas that have very little in it. And I think I said in one of my other videos that look, Six Mile Hex has what, 30 some odd square miles in it, right? So we don't necessarily need to make giant, giant maps, but I think just we tend to, Fan, it's a fantasy usually, and, and you just want to just make everything bigger. So we end up just blowing out these distances. And so you end up with, oh gosh, I've got a thousand miles of woods that the party is zigzagging their way through. Put Throw down some motifs. If you have factions, if you have creatures, and it could be settlements too, different kingdoms, baronies, just villages. Think about the areas around them. I think a lot of times you can end up with all these villages kind of seeming the same. Oh, you've got some farms and you got a collection of buildings. Maybe you have a palisade wall or you have a wooden wall and you got a keep or you, or you have some other kind of larger building or you don't. Okay, well think about what makes this village different than the village that's in the hex over there. Think about some motifs that make this place unique, make this village, the people that inhabit this village 
different from others. If you don't have inspiration to create motifs, if you don't have a, they're not particularly tied to a faction that has a story in your world or a kingdom or other kind of organization that has some kind of interesting things about them, then come up with them. If you have chance beforehand, it's great to be able to find a few things, flip through a dictionary, pick some random words, use some random tables. Again, maybe I will put together some random tables for you. We'll see if I have time to do that. So stay tuned if I do, fingers crossed. I got a lot going on though, so I don't know, we'll see, but I'll put it on my list. Throw some things together, write down one, two, three, four. I think one would, would make it kind of one note, which might work for some things, not for others. I think I like having three, maybe three to five. That way we can, again, form those patterns, right? With where these different things, come in. See if that works to help that when you're speaking about, not just when they get to the village itself, but right, you can do this from the outskirts in. Okay, so the, what are the out farms like? I mean, one obvious example of kind of settlements is the Wizard of Oz, L. Frank Baum. All these different areas that they would go through as they're traveling from Munchkin land to Oz would have different colors. It was very obvious stuff. Oh, the Munchkins, and I don't remember the exact ones. Oh, the Munchkins all dress in blue. These guys all dress in red. In Emerald City, everyone dressed in green. So you have all these different things that were obviously very just eye-poppingly obvious of, oh, hey, we've gone from blue to red to green. We're in different areas. But the concept there is the same in that you were creating these defining features. One, they just, they all dress in, in blue, right? And there could be other ones. Maybe all their homes are built with wattle. What is it, wattle and something else? This area, they're all in red and they use more just timber, log cabin kind of structures. And then you get to Emerald City, everyone's in green and they're using stone. You could even think of more subtle ones. Again, those are very obvious, but the point is, is you come up with these things to help you when you get in the moment, describe things, lay out things for your character, for your players to not only just differentiate different areas, it could also trigger things for them. I know if I threw out a gold boulder to my players, they would probably spend the rest of the session trying to suss things out about this boulder. What is it really made of? Is it solid gold? Could they scrape some of it off? And obviously who put it there and they tracks? Could be a whole adventure hook in and of itself. Oh, and by the way, feel free to sprinkle different hooks into those motifs. If you have two factions of goblins that are fighting and this is a theme in your campaign or an element of your campaign that the party is caught up in wars between goblin tribes, then if you have the red claw over here and you've got, I don't know, the iron jaw over there, what happens in an area where they're fighting over it, where you would see both red claw marks and whatever the iron claw tribe do, depending on who's won, maybe you'd see red claw stuff, you just see remnants because it's all been scratched out and then a big iron jaw kind of thing has been clamped over it or vice versa. So you can play with that and that again just helps differentiate these areas but it also helps you world build, helps you reinforce plot stuff that's happening in your world, help you in your imagination, help you describe stuff to your players to make the world seem interesting. Cause there's one thing I think is a shame that sometimes happen with hex crawls is the world ends up seeming kind of boring or it seems like it's just too busy. So here's some ways without having to throw encounters at your party to, to force them to confront things. You, you're really just laying these, you're teasing them out. You're, you're giving them these little threads that they can follow or not, but it accomplishes a lot of bunch, a, a lot of different things for you that hopefully is beneficial for them. So that's it. Motifs, hopefully this was useful to you. Uh, I am running a giveaway, by the way. I posted a quick, short video. You should see it somewhere. I don't know, YouTube has this shorts thing. Essentially, I'm closing in on a thousand subscribers, so please subscribe to the channel if you like these. Give it a thumbs up if you find it useful. And there's the bell icon, I think, if you wanna get notified right away. But in conjunction with that, I am running a giveaway. I have a newsletter called Bent Worlds. The link will be in the show notes. When I hit a thousand subscribers, I'm going to pick a random person from the subscribers to my newsletter and my patrons on Patreon and anybody and any supporters on Coffee. So if you're on one of those three lists, you're already entered. You have to do nothing. If you want to be part of this giveaway and have a chance to win a copy of Inkwell Ideas' most excellent worldographer program, then subscribe in one of those spots. That's it. I'm not sure when I'm going to hit that. I mean, I suppose I could lose a bunch of subscribers and it could be a year before I hit that hit that milestone, but hopefully it won't be too long. I actually have a bet with my wife. Somehow she picks June, I think like June 2nd or 3rd that I will, will cross and across that particular uh, milestone, I have July 5th. 
as when I've thought maybe I will cross that. I actually think hers is way aggressive. I actually think mine is aggressive. Hey, prove me wrong. Anyhow, I assume that somewhere between then and now in the end of time, I will cross there. I will do the giveaway. If you win, you will be notified. And I hope to do more giveaways in the future if I do. And I already have NorCal Mythos has stepped up to help with that. So I know I'll have at least one more giveaway. They will work the same way. I will just figure out the time print for it after this is all done. I have talked long enough. Game on. Talk to you later. Next.